anybody come in here angry today? Anybody? I did a little bit. I'm honest. I came in here kind of angry today because of some of the stuff that I, I've seen, some of the things that I've, I've watched people do to other people in this world. You ever get angry when you just read stuff online? And you're like, has the world lost its ever-loving mind? What is going... And tell me there's not like an anger associated with that. Like, what are you thinking? Or wait, wait, what are you not thinking in order to say that or do that or go there or continue to repetitively put yourself in a place where you don't even like it when you look back at being there, right? How many of you have been angry this morning? How many of you, in the last day, have seen great injustice? How many of you have seen stuff that just kind of makes your blood kind of boil and say, that isn't right? Why is that? You know, I, I think often of Mark and Sydney when they started Hope Gospel Mission. I know they, they, they did it because they love God and they love the, the, the people that God was going to provide for them to care for in the mission, but I, I know they were angry because <laughs> they saw stuff that should not be the way that it is. Said, we got to do something about this. This is terrible. This is tragic. This is wrong. God has called us to do something about this. And I would, I would say, without putting words in your mouth, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you hated the stuff that you saw going on in people's lives, didn't you? You hated it. You're angry at that. You look at the world, you look at politics. Anybody turn on the news this week? <laughs> Angry, yes. Or you saw what somebody did to you, slighted you, yelled at you, treated you terribly. You look at that and you're like, I hate this. I, I'm so angry and upset. Now, people think that Christians um, should not be angry, right? Has, has anybody heard that? Oh, you... You, you, you just have to like have, you got, you got to trust and you got to just, you know, I don't know, maybe turn the other cheek. Whatever that means for most people that say that. And many times people say, well, you can't get mad. You're a Christian. You heard that one? You can't get mad. You're, you're one of those church people. But. In your anger, which you have, right? Right? The anger that you have is a given. God knows this. God knows you will be angry. And this sounds weird, but that's okay. Because isn't God himself angry at things? So we're called to love the things that God loves, right? Are we called to be angry about the things that God is angry at in this world? Yes. And so this morning, I want to talk about this because there's a lot of anger and I think it kind of gets displaced and it kind of gets misused because we don't know what to appropriately do with the anger that you are all carrying around right now. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says this. You Christians shouldn't be angry. Right? Is that what he says? Uh, he says this. He says, in your anger. Right? What does that say? In the anger that you have right now. In that anger, what does he say? Do not sin. In your anger, you have that, right? And we, we ought to have that. Because if you don't feel any hatred or anger towards evil, atrocious things that are happening, like your compass is way off. With, with, with the justice that God wants to see done in this world, okay? But, but what he says is, in the anger that you do have, do not sin. 
He goes on to say, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So let's take care of it, yeah? And do not give the devil a foothold. Whoa. You hear those warnings? The anger that you have, don't sin in it. Don't harm a neighbor. Don't go belittle people. Don't go metaphorically beat somebody up or actually beat somebody up. Don't do that. He says, if you can take care of it during that day, that's wonderful. And I love this last part. He says, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't, in your anger. Like, like I think we think sometimes that we're, we're really good at thinking awful things in and of ourselves, and we actually are. I'm, I'm oh, <laughs> I'm really good at that. I, Dave has three responses to any question or stimuli. One is, what's the, what's the godly biblical response? What's the funny sarcastic response that most people don't get? And three, the thing that ought not to ever be heard by any person. <laughs> because it's terrible and it's hurtful and it's you you get that like i'm really good at that and then you have the enemy of men's souls coming in here trying to gain a foothold in that and he will leverage and exaggerate in your life the place where you're angry where he wants you to continue to fall into sinful patterns and behaviors and paul says to the ephesians don't let him do that. In the anger you have, righteous anger is not bad, but in the anger that could be unrighteous, don't sin in it and don't let the enemy get a foothold. Is this even possible? <laughs> it's not if perfect sinless anger is a requirement because sin still infects us, right? You're not going to get it right every time. You're not going to do it perfectly. But I don't think that Paul had perfect sinless anger in mind in Ephesians 4 when he quotes King David from Psalm 4.4 to the Ephesians and to us. Paul's point in what he's saying here seems to be that not all anger Christians experience is rooted in the prideful, selfish soil of our, our sin nature. So there are things that you can be angry at that aren't from that. That's going to happen, right? How many of you are like constantly repenting, <laughs> trying to prevent, you know, prevent that from happening again? Lord, I'm so sorry for what I said or what I did or what, you know, I went there again and that, that, that was destructive and I'm sorry for that. But there is a kind of anger that comes from the believer's new spirit-directed, not flesh, spirit-directed nature, even if it is unavoidably stained by the indwelling sin that still persists as it passes through our minds and our mouths. And because the Holy Spirit through David and Paul instructs us to be angry, it means some things must make us righteously angry. So what does this look like? What does it look like to have righteous anger as a Christ follower? So I was kind of ask, well, what is this? What is righteous anger? Where does this come from? And kind of like we stated before, righteous anger is being angry at what makes God angry. And righteous anger is the, the right order of the words there. Righteous anger. Not just anger, but things that we see that are not right that we should be upset about. And we come at it from a place where we understand what the right thing is by God. And because God is not fundamentally anger or angry, his, he is fundamentally righteous in his anger then is a byproduct of his righteousness. So he is only angry at things because he is righteous. 
and he sees things that aren't. You guys tracking? You guys following? Like when God looks at the state of the world right now, there are things that he looks at, and I would, I would venture to say it's the vast majority of things that he looks at and says, oh, mm, what are you doing? What are you doing? And God does that from a position and a posture of perfection. So when God looks at things and is like, he's angry about it, we can't accuse him of not knowing what he's talking about or not understanding the position that things or the situations that things are that God would be angry at them. We can't say, well, you know, if God really understood what, what I'm doing right now, he wouldn't really be angry. Or if God really understood the, the, the circumstances over here, he wouldn't really be angry. No, God knows. <laughs> and God is perfect in his assessment of everything that he's looking at in this plane of existence. And because God is righteous, because God's righteousness in his being perfectly right in all his ways, all of his perfections operating together in perfect pr proportion and consistency and harmony, God is the very definition and standard of goodness, or very perfect standard of righteousness. So when God looks at something, he's angry, and that's because of a righteous anger that he has because of his righteousness. We need to trust that. And if we look in the, the word of God, we understand that God is proclaimed to be good. Like we have in Mark 10, where Jesus is approached by this uh, teacher. Uh, he's like, hey, good teacher Jesus. And Jesus is like, why do you call me good? There's nobody good but God. I love that. It's kind of like he asks a question and answers it at the same time. I love that. Jesus answers the man, no one is good except God alone. God is good. God is righteous. When he looks at things, he understands them through that lens. And what God says and what God does are good because they are all of them righteousness. They're all righteous. They perfectly represent God's perfection. So what makes God angry, okay? So he's all perfectly righteous, right? There's no sin or no turning in him. There's no change. He is who he is. He's self-contained in his perfect right standing in his own standards, and he gets to set those, amen? And then in that righteousness, we can ask the question, so what makes God angry? Well, what makes God angry is the perversion of his goodness. So the turning wrong of what he made to be right makes God angry. And you, you'll see that all over the place. Um, people don't really do anything that's inherently evil, or they don't take something that's inherently evil. They take stuff that God made to be good, and they use it inappropriately in a way that God says, wait a second, that is not what I had in mind for that. Like, is a Corvette good? Come on. Yeah, Corvette's good. What if I drive it through a schoolyard full of children, aiming at them? <laughs> That's bad. All right? What about marriage? Is marriage good? Yes! Marriage is good. What if I beat my wife up? That's bad. What God meant for good. Not only does Satan try to pervert for evil, but sometimes we fall into that as well. And God calls that perversion of what he made to be good, evil. And evil twists and disfigures God's glory and wrecks what is most valuable and it pollutes what is most holy. 
evil poisons and distorts reality, resulting in the destruction of joy for everything that chooses the, the perversion over God's good. And God's righteous demands, righteousness demands that as he sees that and says that's not righteous, that's unrighteous, God's righteousness demands that his anger over such destructive, destructive perversion and that he brings justice against those who commit such evil. So, hmm, something meant for good and we say we don't care. In fact, I'm going to let the devil get a foothold in that maybe. But God says, no, these are things that should not be. And he says that from the state of perfect goodness, perfect justness, perfect holiness. And he says, you, these things you shouldn't do. And that righteousness demands anger. So our anger, too, our anger is righteous when we are angered over evil that goes against God's holiness and perverts his goodness, right? So we take and follow the lead of God in that. Like, how many of you just kind of look at stuff, you know, it just makes your stomach sick when you see it. Like, there's this kind of righteous indignation towards things. Like, what is going on? Like, I looked uh, around the neighborhood a couple years ago, and you, we saw, like, Dozens of people every day come into this one place to buy something that would poison their mind. Something that was like taking their life. Something that was causing people to be uncontrollable. Like even out in public during the daylight. <laughs> and we watched that and say, what is... Th like, I was mad. I was angry to see... People selling people one of the most destructive drugs that you can take in your body, and people are just flocking for it, and we're watching what it's doing to their lives. And I was mad. Like, Ann was mad. <laughs> and you'll see stuff like that, won't you? Yeah, you'll see it, like, in other people's lives, but be keenly aware that you can even recognize that in yourself. Are you somebody that should be angry at themselves for the way that they're being sometimes? Do you ever do stuff that's destructive? Do you ever do stuff that hurts other people? Hurts the heart of God? You ought to be angry about those things. But humans, and this is the hard part, guys, because a lot of times in, 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 in the current condition that we're in, we're not totally redeemed out of committing sin yet. We're not in the glorified body yet. Because we still have evil left in us, okay? <laughs> There's, right? It's still lurking here. Um, in humanity, because we're still evil, <laughs> we're not always characterized with righteous anger, but sinful anger. Be aware of that. James 1.20, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God because the anger of man is more concerned with man than with God. So when that anger hits, realize where that's coming from, and you know exactly what I mean. You know, we tend to get angrier over our slighted pride than over the soiling of God's glory. And that's not a, right? That's not like a righteous anger. We tend to get, oh, get angrier over a minor inconvenience than a, a grievous injustice. We're often self-righteously angry like the older brother over his prodigal sibling. Just read that story sometime. Luke 15. Keep going back there. Remember the son that went away? Dad, give me your stuff because I wish you were dead. I'd rather have your stuff than you. And he goes and squanders and he comes back. And the father is like, oh, it's my son that was alive. He's dead. He's now alive. He's with me. He's here. 
And the father throws a big party. My son that was lost is now found. And one that was dead is now alive. And the older brother said, right? Well, what about me, dad? I've been here the whole time and you won't even give me a goat. <laughs> Read that. Read. Find out where you're at in that. You the older brother? We'll get angry about being with the father because we didn't get everything we wanted out of it. <laughs> right? We can be self-righteously angry like that or we can be selfishly angry like Jonah over the death of a plant while not caring about the welfare of 120,000 people. You read that in Jonah 4 and you're like, what an idiot. Right? We, we see in Jonah 4, 9 through 11, after God sends this plant, because Jonah's like, oh God, I'm, 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 it's so hot, Lord, I'm suffering. And the Lord sends this leafy plant to Jonah and it grows up so he can have some shade and it said it gave him comfort and he was, he was perfectly okay because he had this, this shade from the hot sun. And then in verse 9 of Jonah 4, it says, but God said to Jonah after the plant was eaten by a worm and dies. And he's mad. But God said to Jonah, is caring about the welfare of 120,000 people, right? Uh, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Like, what about the thing I called you to do? You mad about a plant? God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? It is, he said. <laughs> That's Jonah's response. It is. And Jonah goes on to say, and I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. It sounds like a little kid having a tantrum, doesn't it? God, I just wish I was dead right now. I'm going to run away. I'm going to go hide, you know. <laughs> You're mean. <laughs> like you can kind of picture it that way almost. Uh, verse 10, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Verse 11, And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And you're mad about a plant. Is that righteous anger? No. That's anger that's rooted in sin. That's the anger that's, you know, things aren't fair. God's not giving me what I want. I'm not happy in life, right? And anger rooted in sin produces, this is out of 2 Corinthians 12, 20, it produces discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. That sound like where we want to go as believers? And also in Galatians 5.20, anger rooted in sin produces hatred, jealousy, fits of rage. You know another word for fits of rage? Tantrums. <laughs> it provides that. It provides discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. So the sinful anger, not the righteous anger, the sinful anger, Anger is so common, even in the believer, it's so common in us that we must be regularly reminded to put that away. Like Paul says in Colossians 3.8, put away anger. Put away the anger that causes rage. Put away the anger that causes malice. And you want to do that because that's so destructive to you. But just as Christ says in Matthew 5, 22, that if that, that anger, that, that unrighteous, sinful anger comes out of you and lands on other people, we start putting ourselves in the place where Jesus in Matthew 5 says that anyone who is angry that way with his brother will be subject to judgment. Oh. 
Whoa! So not only is that self-destructive, that's destructive to other people. And God's like, I see when you do that. Don't do that. <laughs> now, I, can, can you re you guys know when you're doing that kind of anger, right? Where you're hurting other people, you're just talking down about them, and you're, or you're stealing from them, or you're misusing them, or... Well, you know, right? You 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 know when you do that, and you know you definitely know when that's being done to you. But the other anger that we should have, the the righteous anger, when you engage in that, doesn't look or feel like sinful anger because godly anger is actually governed and directed by love. God is righteous. Amen. He's right. He is the perfect standard of rightness, but he's also love. Right? First John 4, right? God is love. Amen. And love is patient. I just read that at Kirk and Joe's wedding, so I looked at them. <laughs> But God is righteous, but God is also love, and love is patient. Is unrighteous anger patient? You should have ridden with me when we used to drive through Chicago. <laughs> it's like, oh man, like if what was up here came out in something, like it would have been really terrible. <laughs> Righteous anger is patient because it loves. And that's why God repeatedly describes himself in Scripture as merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And you'll see that scattered throughout the Scriptures. You'll see it. That's his character and his personality. Where God is slow to to anger, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 3 9. Like if God were not loving and patient in his anger, he just would have snuffed me out real early. Because I would have deserved it. But that's not his character. God will bring righteous judgment to bear, but he does not willingly or wantingly bring affliction or grief to everyone. He does not take any joy in that because he loves and he's slow to engage in things where maybe some punishment happens, right? Or you start seeing some actual justice rather than mercy in life. And he moves, God moves with a, a measured, merciful, loving slowness. And if you want to see this, if you want to see love govern anger in operation, just look at Jesus. And Jesus knew a day of judgment was coming when he would come to earth as the king of kings. And like in Revelation 19, it talks about, He's going to come and he's going to tread his enemies in the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Revelation 19, 15 and 60 says that, right? But long before bringing judgment, he came to bring salvation to his enemies. Right? He says that in John 12. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And what did he show up here with? Or, or the condition of the world? When he died, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And when he came to save, he rarely expresses anger. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed? He's not just going off on people. He's not all yelling and screaming at people or like trying to like manipulate them. He's just telling the truth. And he's he's showing like kindness and compassion to Pretty much everybody he turns to, even the Pharisees that are trying to trap him and stuff, he explains exactly what he knows they're doing and what he's doing 
in response to them or what the kingdom of God is doing. He does He could have just been like, you know, hey, lightning, you know. <laughs> Maybe that'd be a more efficient way to do things. But he doesn't do that. He rarely expressed that kind or that manifestation of anger. And those who walk closest with Jesus are also marked by this remarkable patience, especially with sinful people, which is pretty much everybody, right? The people that walk closest with Jesus, they are extremely quick to hear. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. You can tell when somebody is like not walking close with Jesus because they'll tell you six ways to Sunday as to why they're right when they know they're wrong and you know that they know that the, you know that they're wrong. <laughs> but they won't let you tell them anything or they won't listen to you. They are quick to speak, slow to listen, and extremely quick to become unrighteously angry. <laughs> but the people that are walking with Jesus, like I, I, man, I don't even know what Mark would look like mad. <laughs> Cindy knows, okay. <laughs> I've been with Mark in some pretty tense situations and with some pretty obnoxious elements in the room, and he just kind of is, hey, you know, Let's listen to this. Let's find out what's going on. I think things will be okay. God always provides. And the people that are walking close with Christ, they do get angry, but like Jesus, their, their anger is bound by something. It's bound by the grief in what they're witnessing. You know, occasionally... Like Christ, people might flip the table in the temple. But at the same time, they're still weeping over Jerusalem. So being angry and not sinning requires the discernment of a constant practice of going back to God's word. Like, Lord, how, how should I view through the lens of your word, through the lens of the gospel, what's actually happening in front of me. Keep going back to God himself. Lord, how would you have me to be in this moment? Because so much of our anger is rooted in our prideful, selfish, sin nature. We need to know, how, God, how would you view this? How would you have me act now? How would you have me, have me respond in a Christ-like way? manner and if we've suffered under the tyranny of sinful angry people emotionally it's sometimes it's hard to discern what kind of anger we should be expressing or what we're expressing right in that moment but because it's something that God calls us to we must pursue to this end of saying Lord I want to be in submission to what pleases you right now what are you angry about right now, God? You ever found yourself asking that question where I was maybe angry at the person when God is saying, you got to be angry at the person's sin and then show them mercy because they're suffering under it. They don't even understand what they're doing right now. I'm sorry, I keep pointing to Annie. Uh, she doesn't know anything. <laughs> yeah, wait till you don't, you don't see anger. <laughs> but we, we, you know, we have. But we, we need to be aware of that. What, what kind of anger do I have? How should I be angry right now? What does it look like, God? What should this, what should this look like? I remember counseling this. I think I've shared this before. But I was counseling this couple back in Lansing, Michigan. If you're watching, guys, I'm not naming any names. So, anyway, um, like the the guy was just terrible to his wife, and she would like you know, give it back. And like, they're doing this in front of me. So I can only imagine what stuff is like at home, right? Like if you're willing to do this in public, what, what does it look like when you're behind closed doors and that? And they were just, just mad, just angry. And I'm like, why are you guys so mad? Like, why are you guys letting this destroy your relationship? Why are you 
enjoying destroying one another right now because we're angry I said do you think I'm angry right now and they're like well I don't think so I'm like well I am and if I gave into the emotional part of my anger right now I'd reach across my desk and strangle you and the guy said you can't talk to me like that I said I just did <laughs> because that's how I feel right now but that's a destructive sense of things right that that would be a destructive thing that's not going to help that's going to hurt what does righteous anger look like in a Christian it's something that we we see we see how evil pollutes we see it we know that something is wrong and we increasingly as you are walking with the Lord increasingly you will become distressed and this is out of second Peter 2 you'll become distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless <laughs> and find their lawless deeds tormenting after a time you're like oh man I started to see it all the time now I'm I'm seeing how people that break God's law are people that sin against God I can see it it's right there increasingly in that you're gonna start caring more about God's reputation than about your own when you see people doing destructive things like that that's why as a Christian when you see something get angry like you don't walk up saying I'm angry at you Marshall right Marshall <laughs> no I'm not angry at Marshall I don't run up and say, I'm, I'm angry at Marshall if I, if I see Marshall coming off the rails I said, I, we baptize you, brother. You're, you're a Christian. You, you proclaim Christ, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is what God said. This is what God desires from you, Marshall. Right? Yeah. And so we talk about God. We talk about his reputation amongst people. We don't front ourselves in that because people will say, well, are you perfect? Absolutely not. That's why I don't talk to, about me as the mark of perfection. When I'm angry because I have a righteous anger, I go back and say, well, what, is God angry at this? Absolutely. And then I need to go tell that person, this is what God said about this. Not me. I'm not saying this. This is what God said. And when do we find that? Like, we have to go, go tell people, like, you need to focus on prayer right now, or repentance, or fasting, maybe. Biblical meditation. You need to get into the Word. And if you recognize these things as you look at the person in the mirror, you need to do the same thing. Right? Because righteous anger, when you get that, what it sees first when you see people is the log in your own eye okay so we don't roll up to people and be like hey let me tell you about how much better I am than you you roll up to people and say I've seen this before oh man yeah I remember how that really prevented me from seeing what's true and I'm so thankful that 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 I prayed for God to remove that 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 huge hindrance that huge besetting sin was removed from my life so I can now see clearly even to like the little speck that might be in Randy's eye so when, if Randy has a problem I look at my problem that I used to have with God first before I do anything there because when we first see the log in our own eyes we are humbled we are grieved and we are angered firstly by our own falling short of God's goodness And we repent before we go ask anybody else to do the same thing. Amen? Don't tell somebody else to do something that God told his people to do that you yourself are unwilling to do. Like if that's happening, don't say anything to the person. especially when it's coming from the direction of well God said people need to do this well you're not doing it I'll come back in a week you know <laughs> let's talk in a week 
but but righteous anger, like when you see when you see it going on in somebody's life, righteous anger is grieved, not just infuriated by evil that you see. You know, we see Jesus again flipping the tables in the temple, but he was deeply grieved over the sin that made it necessary to do that. Anger with no tears over evil is often evidence of a lack of love in us. Right? If you love God and you love the person that you see self-destructing, if you're not crying over that, you don't really care about the person. You're just mad. Righteous anger is grieved when you see injustice. Righteous anger is governed by God's love, too. Amen? God's love governs our righteous anger, and therefore our anger is slow to be expressed, which then allows redemptive acts of love to be pursued first, if at all possible. You ever heard of people getting loved into the kingdom? Anybody? They got, like, you ever heard a person's testimony? Like, man, it's not that they just, they got the big Bible out and, you know. It's, I've not seen love like that, and boy, did that flip the script on me. <laughs> I think that's Dave's story. Like, there was just kind of like this constant expression, like, hey, man, we love you. Hey, man, we love you. Hey, man, we love you. Not, well, you done screwed up. You're out. <laughs> Get out of here. We, did, we don't want this. You know, we don't want this. Like, talk to somebody else the other day, and they're like, you know, I, I used to be all about rules. Like, if you follow the rules, you're good. He said, but then I saw the way that people express love, especially in the problematic relationship things. And man, does that win people over. The love of Christ really wins people over. It covers over a multitude of sins when we extend that into the life of someone else. And we should truly want mercy to triumph over judgment for others because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And we need to remember Jesus' mercy toward us and that he first came carrying a cross. Right? He didn't come in with the sword right away, did he? He first came with a cross, but someday he comes with a sword. And righteous anger acts swiftly when necessary. Because some forms of evil require us to be quick in our response, quick to act. Like what about the needless slaughter of people, no matter how big they are? Amen? or of human injustice or abuse, doesn't matter what kind of abuse it is. It doesn't matter if the abuse is emotional, physical, sexual, it doesn't matter. When you see that, you want to say, whoa, 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 wait a second, what are you doing? You need to stop. And when we see trafficking of people or adultery or persecution and other such evils, this is a call for us an urgent call for an immediate rescue. Like Proverbs 24.11 says, Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you see somebody that's going to die, if you see something that's like that's going to be a, the end, do something right then, right? I can't let that continue. I gotta do something. I hate that. I, I know what's gonna happen. I gotta do something right now. So that's the response, guys. Yeah, it's governed by love. It's 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 grieved. Your soul should be grieved when you see evil happening or when you see like fallen people doing stuff that is hurting them and others. 
You ought to show mercy. You ought to show grace. But there are times when you got to stop something right in its tracks, too. It's going to end somebody. If, if that's the end, you got to intervene there. Like, I remember standing in a store one time, and it was during Christmas, and everybody's, like, in a really good mood around the holidays while they're shopping, right? As they're running over people for cheap TVs, you know? Even pregnant women getting stampeded on because there's a 27-inch plasma over there. For $189, I got to get that, right? So is it uh, Meyer? Meyer is like a in between Walmart and Target kind of a place in Michigan. And this guy uh, like had his uh, place kind of moved in line. And this lady, he thought, took his place in the line. And he like gets in her face and starts like screaming at her. And he's about this much taller than she is. And he's just yelling at her and screaming at her. And I'm like, this is going to get really bad. <laughs> this is going to get ugly real quick. So me being the thinking person that I am, I went and got between them. And he said, this isn't your issue. You, this is none of your business. I said, well, I just made it my business. I said, and you're not going to hurt her. If you're going to hurt anybody, you can hurt me. How about that? I didn't get hit, so that was a God blessing right there. But you might see times and places where you need to inject your life immediately. But when you do that, remember, you're doing it to honor the Lord. So you do it because you love, and you're, you're doing it because you're wanting to prevent there from more sin happening, more consequential things happening. We're never going to be perfectly angry in this age, guys, but we can grow in the grace of righteous anger. God means us to, and it is part of conforming to the image of Christ. Remember, he was mad, he was angry, but he didn't sin, and neither should we. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. Do what I told you. I know it's best for you. And one of the scriptural commands is, in your anger, do not sin.